Greetings all. Welcome to another session here of Tuesday Talks. We're going to continue our st uh, study and discussion in uh, second language acquisition, the foundations that we're going to be looking at today. Uh, we're going to look at, uh, you know, a little bit of the foundations of uh, the nature of language learning. We'll look at a comparison between first language and second language and how they're, how they're similar, but they are different. We're going to look at some of the problems of learning a language with regard to uh, the need to have more input, okay, and that's a problem. And then finally, we're going to just look at uh, all of the research uh, theories and uh, ideas that have come about since the 1950s, since uh, post-World War II. Let's just jump into the introduction here and talk a little bit about uh, uh, some particular uh, words. Uh, definitions for for language here. We're going to talk about language use. People who are multilingual, obviously they know more than uh, two languages. Uh, bilingual is knowing two languages. Monolingual is knowing one language. And then there's a word that I often use when I'm talking to people who are monolinguals. That's the word monoglot. I use that as a pejorative because I believe that everybody should learn more than one language. So I often uh, say, you know, oh, you're a monoglot. Uh, as sort of a negative thing. Just an aside here, I had a uh, an acquaintance that I met when I was uh, in Germany, and this gentleman uh, told me this joke. Uh, he said, "Someone who speaks three language is three languages is called uh, multilingual. Someone who speaks two languages is bilingual, and someone who speaks one language is an American." Which I thought was rather interesting. So, <laughs> anyway. Um, different levels of language use there. Second language learners are different than first language learners. And they're different in a variety of ways with the stuff that's going on in the brain there. One is their, uh, their knowledge. The knowledge that they possess is going to be different than the knowledge that a monoglot, a monolingual person is going to have. Primarily because they can compare between the two. And they can sense a new, different nuance between uh, a word uh, they can see that there are multiple ways of seeing something, multiple ways of uh, expressing an idea because they can do the comparison. They have that extra knowledge, therefore, uh, they're going to have a different thinking process than, than monolinguals. You can also understand perspectives probably a little better than someone who's a monolingual because a monolingual only knows their culture, only knows their language. And as a bilingual or a multilingual, you have to step outside of where you're, where you are, and see it from a different language, from a different culture, from a different perspective. Also, a difference in linguistic awareness. They know more about language, um, different ways that it's used, and how it's used. Uh, again, because they can do a comparison. And then the cognitive processes that's going on in the brain are different. Obviously, we've got different sets of information. Now, whether those sets are overlapping. Right, the, the multiple languages or the processes for evaluating are overlapping or separate um, is unknown as of right now. I mean, there's obviously research on it. We'll look a little bit at those a little later, but uh, cognitive processes are going to be different. Some may ask, why in the world do you want to learn a second language? What are the reasons for learning a second language? Well, one would be conquest. Uh, you know, the Greeks took over for a short while over the Middle East and they spread their language everywhere. Well. Because I'm conquered, I now need to learn that second language. Maybe economic. Um, there are people who only want to learn another language because they want to go to France and uh, get involved in French business. They want to go to Germany. They want to. They want to. Uh, you, you know, they want to have a chance to interact in Taiwan. So they're going to learn that language, business-wise. Others will learn a language because of religious uh, reasons. Um, you know, it may be that. Uh, uh, you know, they want to learn uh, Hindu, they want to learn Christianity, they want to learn some language, and to do so, it's going to be easier if they learn that other language. Other people immigrate. Other people want to get a good education, so they learn a particular language. For some people, it's just their job. Uh, you know, people are coming here to the United States because they have uh, their, uh, a branch office uh, here, so they learn. Uh, they learn English so they can come here and do that. So it could be a job. could be just curiosity. People are just curious. Some people like language. I know they're weird people, but they're out there, and they think uh, language is interesting. So a number of reasons why uh, people might want to learn a language. It's interesting that there are nowadays more and more people who would like to count 
uh, the number of language users, number of first language users or second language users. One quote that I often hear is that uh, English is the number one spoken language in the world, even though the number one first language spoken is probably Mandarin Chinese. The number one spoken language, because many people are second language speakers of English, would be English. But how do they do that? How do they count all those? Identifying linguistic populations is difficult. And uh, for a, a few reasons here that I'm going to lay out here, actually, this is uh, Seville Troika's idea, but I might as well lay it out here. Sometimes it's difficult to find out because we don't collect the information. <clears throat> Uh, we don't make it mandatory that we collect the information. In fact, only recently, since probably uh, the the uh, introduction of uh, the no, Le no Child Left Behind Act, do are schools now required to ask if students speak another language when they're registering to go into school? Um, anyway, they're collecting that information. That doesn't mean people need to give out that information. Um, it may be that the answers to the p questions that people make aren't reliable. Uh, people may be afraid to find to tell you know what language that they speak for fear of prejudice, for fear of being relegated to minority. So they may not be giving that information. It may be a power issue. Additionally, there's also a poor consensus on the meaning of some words. The example. Uh, that Seville Troika brings out is uh, the whole idea of language dominance. Which one's a dominant language and which one isn't? So when you're asking the question, people may not understand exactly what's being going, going on there or how it's defined, how it's described, and so the data is less, uh, less reliable. Um, we do want to understand and identify who these are, obviously for research purposes, but it's a difficult process. All right, the nature of language learning. And uh, what is it like? Well, one thing that we know is that it's inherent in us. It's something that we do. We, we are language learners. Um, you put a kid, an infant, in a community, and whether you speak to this kid or not, uh, provided he has some form of linguistic interaction, he's going to learn. So kids, it's inherent within them. Uh, they have interaction and they have stimulus. And uh, their, their brains are going to pick up these things. Uh, now Chomsky will say that it's an innate process. Others will say uh, that it isn't. Uh, we'll talk about that a little later. But the truth of the matter is that kids learn these from the get-go, and they do not need any specific training in order to learn language. For kids, the role of ability, well, it's innate. It's part of who they are. It's part of who we are. Uh, again, some people will say we're hardwired to learn language. It's interesting also that learning language and intelligence are not connected in, they're not the same. They are distinct. There is some overlap with them, but the ability to learn a language and the, you know, the ability, uh, the, the intel, someone's intelligence uh, ability are not connected necessarily. So you find people that may have difficulties uh, with learning. To, they may have a lower intelligence, but they can learn a language. You might find people who are very intelligent but have difficulty learning a second language. So there's going to be a difference there. The rate of development be, for children also varies. Some children acquire it earlier. Others acquire it later. Um, so uh, you can't judge everything uh, at the same time. There are, there are parents, you know, they have a, a kid who's a year old and they start, they start talking at 13, 15 months. You've got other kids, they're two before they start taking off. I, one of my children in particular uh, took him to the, uh, the doctor for a regular checkup or a booster, I don't know what, but when we mentioned that the child wasn't speaking very much, they suggested I take them to a specialist because this isn't right. And it wasn't uh, a month or two later that we couldn't get this kid to shut up. <laughs> so there is a rate of development, and it does depend uh, on a number of factors, some that we don't, uh, we have difficulty defining, but suffice it to say that they vary. Um, there may also be a critical period in uh, children learning. There have been researches and discoveries of people who were had no exposure to language until they were 9, 10, and then they had problems learning language afterwards. So there may be this whole idea of a critical period. Um, but with, uh, with kids, they, they have uh, interaction. They interact with we, either with a TV or with a movie or with people. 
Uh, and then they have, uh, I'm sorry, and then they have stimulus. Now those two go together there. There's also the role of uh, social experience. Language learning requires input. Uh, now there's a, it's an interesting thing that uh, um, some parents speak directly to their children, some don't. Some parents read to their children, some don't. Provided that there is uh, some form, whether it's direct or indirect, uh, the in, well, provided that there's input there, kids are going to learn. They're going to learn at about the same rate. They're not going to learn to read and write at the same rate, but they're going to learn to communicate orally uh, at about the same rate, which I find interesting. Uh, children who are read to, children who read at an earlier age and understand those at an earlier age are going to be able to read and write typically better than those who read later later in life. So there is uh, an interesting uh, research on, on that. Kids who live in a multilingual environment, okay, truly multilingual, they're probably going to learn both at the same time. Uh, because they're within that environment. I had a friend uh, living in the United States. Uh, sh uh, he was American. She was Japanese. And uh, um, whenever there were people there, especially whenever there were ladies there, and all the ladies were together, they'd all speak in Japanese. Whenever any men came over, they would all speak in English. Kids early on began to think that it was a gender-based thing, that women spoke in Japanese, that men spoke in English. And uh, so every now and again, you would have a, a female walk in who didn't know any Japanese, and the kids would talk to them in Japanese, uh, thinking that that was the way it was. So rather interesting. But anyway, kids learn both at the same time. Um, teaching the first language is generally not necessary, again, for oral communication. Um, and I know that you've had experiences where you're trying to correct a kid uh, to say the word properly. I always use the example of spaghetti and pischetti. Um, and no matter how many times you tell this kid, they're not going to be able to get it. I do hope you watch uh, the video that's on YouTube about this little girl who is asked... Uh, where she is. And she's sitting on a beach in uh, Miami and she looks at her daddy and she says, oh, we're, we're at your Amy. <laughs> and the daddy says, no, we're at Miami. Didn't matter how many times she tried to correct the kid, they couldn't understand. <laughs> now, it's probably a slightly different from your typical pronunciation things or grammar things. Suffice it to say that teaching L1 has little impact on the actual uh, learning of a first language. Again, we're not talking about reading and writing. Learning of a first language. Children are going to pick it up uh, as they're ready to handle it. Um, reading and teaching reading is beneficial at a younger age. Um, but the other ones aren't. So it's the nature of language. It's within us. Um, it uh, requires input. It is innate. And there may be a critical period. Here is a sample, again, from Seville Troika, a little chart that she created um, regarding the differences between first and second language learning. In the initial state, children, little infants, they have an innate ability. Second language learners may have an innate ability. It's debated. Uh, I would think they do. But they also have their first language. Um, someone who comes from Ecuador to the United States and uh, they're trying to learn English, well, they have, they have Spanish or, or the dialect or the language that they use uh, if, they, if it isn't Spanish for them. They have world knowledge. They have knowledge of the world. They have knowledge of their country, of their culture. If they've studied about the United States, they have that knowledge as well. So they have a lot more than a child who's learning initially, because that kid only has that init that innate ability. Finally, in the initial state, there's interaction skills. So you can ask questions, you can interact, you can negotiate, you can learn. So it's interesting when you look at the initial states here, the second language learner has more to play with than the first language learner. The first language learner only has innate ability and interaction. The second language learner has innate ability, but has more information they can deal with. So it's interesting there. You get to intermediate uh, state. Kids are now a little older. They've matured a little. They have now input. They have interaction with the uh, the state that they're in, with the the family that they're in, with the in the uh, environment that they're in. Second language learners, they have uh, uh, that input and that interaction, but they also have transfer. 
Um, they're transferring information from their first language, their first culture, into their second language, second culture. Now, it could be positive transfer. It could be negative transfer, depending on, you know, the luck of the draw. <laughs> Um, but there could, they could have that intermediate phases. They're going to have interaction. They're going to have input. Um, okay. They're going to have feedback as well. People are going to interact with them and give them feedback of whether things are good or bad or right or wrong. Another issue is going to be aptitude. Some second language learners don't have the aptitude to learn that second language. We talked about this earlier, difference between ability and intelligence. Third, uh, third, fourthly, whatever number this is, they may not be motivated. They may be less motivated to learn, or may they may be extremely motivated. That's going to be a factor. Again, first language learning doesn't really matter. They're going to learn it regardless um, because it's this innate ability. Lastly would be instruction. What type of instruction is someone getting to learn a second language? Is it good instruction? Is it motivating? Is it helpful, or isn't it? Okay, and then in the final state, well, you have native competence. Kids at like you know ages of five, six, seven, uh, they can communicate in in their first language, no problem. Multilinguals eventually they can communicate. Uh, they have multilingual competence. Okay, they have more information than the first first language people, but eventually they can get to there, provided that they continue walking through the process. Again, they're not motivated, they're going to stop. They don't have the aptitude, it's going to be more difficult. They have bad instruction, they may not continue. Okay, any number of reasons there. Right? Comparison between first language learning and second language learning. Very nice little chart, thank you. All right, the problem that uh, some people are going to have, or the problem that uh, some researchers have with this idea of language learning. See, the problem that uh, people like Chomsky, Noam Chomsky, is going to have, or any of his followers, um, is that uh, the whole concept of stimulus response or the behaviorist ideas for language learning it does not, I'm sorry, requires more input than students, than learners actually get, right? So the question here, how can children learn a first language with little input? or training. How can they do it with such ease? There is a problem of the stimulus. There's not enough of it. They don't get enough to learn all the structures. In fact, so student, these students, kids, they learn the second, uh, they learn the structure um, without, without even hearing it. Uh, they may not have an example of it, but they can put it together. Um, they learn things like that. Um, there are also principles and properties that cannot be learned. Um, morphemes, uh, suffixes, prefixes, uh, the meanings of uh, certain lexical elements, not taught directly, and yet students can pick up what they mean. Okay? Again, uh, learning these properties is not the same as intelligence. They're separate entities. Um, and so there's a problem there because kids aren't getting the, the information that they need. They don't have the stimulus there to make this possible. So children... Uh, are getting this acquisition, but they're not getting stimulus, sufficient stimulus to do this, which is why the idea of, a, of generative linguistics is so appealing to many people, many researchers, uh, because it then allows for children to have this innate ability, this hardwired capability. Some would even say it's hardwired information, part of the learning program, um, that, uh, that enables them to learn a language even though they don't have enough um, don't have enough uh, stimulus input. It's interesting also that children uh, acquire um, lang language uh, regardless of uh, they, I'm sorry children acquire language at about the same rate regardless of their first language. So little Korean babies and little Spanish babies and little French babies, all learn to communicate all around the same uh, stages of development. And if you go and study uh, language development uh, of of uh, little of infants and, and little kids, you'll see that regardless of language, they go through a very similar process. Again, points to the fact that it's probably this innate ability that uh, is turned on that allows them to learn this language in those similar stages. Quite interesting field of study. And speaking of fields of study, here's a little 
um, overview of a whole bunch of different uh, areas um, of uh, of study in linguistics through through the years. In the 1950s, we had structuralism, which is basically a focus on structure. Uh, your more traditional way of learning grammar translation type of method. You had behaviorism, which is uh, basically the idea of stimulus response. Um, you know, this is a ball, and then everybody repeats, this is a ball. And you have some type of stimulus and some type of response that encourages this language learning. Um, you have the sociocultural theory, where you have to put everything into some sort of sociocultural field. Uh, this is where Vygotsky begins, and he's talking about the zones of proximal development, the need for scaffolding. Uh, we need to have the other. So you can see all this is going on here. In the 1960s, transformational gener generative grammar uh, takes hold. Noam Chomsky basically uses this to blow away um, the whole idea of behaviorism um, as being uh, sufficient. Um, behaviorism is probably necessary. It is certainly not sufficient. And uh, Chomsky and his other researchers showed very nicely that there's more going on than just a stimulus response. Anyway, that's happened in the 1960s. We have people in neurolinguistics and information processing that are looking at what's going on in the brain, beginning to realize that they can follow the synapses and the, and the storage of uh, information in the brain to see how all this works, to see how language is learned. There's the idea that uh, processing information allows people to actually learn and so it's the actual ability of the brain to process and store information that's going to allow people to learn language. Now at this time we're also having more ethnographies and communication type of researches where ethnographies are where you sit and monitor a group or somebody for a very long period of time in order to understand more of what's going on and the idea of using an ethnography or that area or that field of study in order to learn and also to teach language, being in the environment as it were. In the 1970s, we continue this whole area in linguistics with regard to functionalism and beginning to study the function of language, the function of grammar, the function of, of, of vocabulary, the terms and the, and the quote-unquote linguistic components of vocabulary, like morphemes. Uh, we have humanistic models where we're trying to move uh, uh, again, what's going on within with, within the brain, and see how this human interaction uh, can help language learning. We have acculturation theory, and this is a theory that basically talks about uh, wanting to adapt and to fit into a different culture, and you acquire this second culture. Also allows you to be more interested and apt to learn a second language. If you're not interested in learning that second language, or if you're stay, if there's a power issue, or if there's something going on, I'm very proud of my language and culture, and you know, then you're going to have different things there. But that's this whole idea of acculturation theory. In the 80s, we had the principle and uh, parameter model. And again, this was looking at certain things within the internal grammatical structure learning system, this language acquisition device type of thing, where there were certain rules and things that had to be going on. They're trying to further fine tune this whole generative grammar idea. Um, at the same time in the 80s, they started dealing with uh, connectionism. And the whole idea was that the more connections, the more synaptic connections the brain could make, the greater the ability to learn language. So in other words, uh, those that have more synaptic connections are going to be able to communicate and create language. If you look at the whole area of uh, linguistic evolution, there are people who will say that the reason why lower order primates do not have the ability to learn language is because their brain isn't large enough. There aren't not as enough synaptic connections. Anyway, this is also connected to uh, no pun intended, uh, to technology and making neural networks uh, and making all these connections and hopefully through this the process uh, of uh, um, learning can occur. We have uh, socio-psychology, how people interact in groups and how this interaction within groups can help people to learn language better. The minimalist program is basically the refined uh, work again of generative grammar and it's the rules and processes and the ideas all fit together into a small program. Processability um, is the idea of the brain and learning that occurs provided that there is uh, 
that the brain is able to process something. If the brain's not able to process it, then they're not going to be able to learn. Interactionist approaches, and there are a number of those um, that uh, say that language is only going to occur provided that there is interaction between people groups, so that language is learned within a group. It's not learned by itself. Nowadays, we have uh, interfaces, and we have complexity theory, which is based off of uh, chaos theory, and uh, we have uh, computer-mediated communication. How that works within language learning, I don't know, but people are beginning to research in that area. This is uh, one page that looks over a whole bunch of different theories and whatnot. We'll take a little more of a detailed look here in the next couple of pages. Regarding the linguistic framework, there are two basic areas that, that uh, researchers are investigating. We have an internal focus. We're talking basically what's going on within the brain and the rules and processes, things that we don't normally think about, really, is what this is, and how this transformational generative grammar works inside the brain. We have this innate ability. We have these parameters. We have this, possibly, this universal grammar, which basically talks about the fact that uh, the, the program that's on side, inside the brain will turn on or activate uh, certain things depending on the environment that they're in, and that the grammar is basically the same. The grammar in any language is basically the same. You have subjects, you have verbs, you have objects. How they're put together is uh, a variable, and then the, that minimalist program can activate or deactivate, whether it's you know, subject, verb, object, subject, verb, right, verb, verb, object, and it's going to change that. But the basic structure is all there regardless of language. Uh, very interesting thing there. But that's all internal. These are things that language teachers probably are not going to be interested in because they want to be able to focus on the external. How can I use what's going on in the brain to learn language so that people can communicate? They're interested more in the functionality of language, two different word areas in, in the linguistic framework. In the psychological framework, you've got a number of different areas as well. You've got language and brain how the language is actually functioning with the brain. We have brain, which is the physical stuff that you can touch, and we have mind, okay, which are the ideas and thinking, and some might even say the, the soul or the spirit that's there. Okay, well, part of this is language and, and brain, the neuro-linguistics of things. Uh, part of this is the learning processes. What's going on with the information that's being processed within the brain? And how is that going to help language learning? For example, processing is believed to cause uh, learning and that it's a complex state. Um, it's not easily understood because there are many factors going on within the brain. Processability, if it is able to process, it means that acquisition can occur. In other words, the only way you're going to learn is if your brain is able to process this information. If it's not able to process it, you're not going to be able to learn. Okay? Then we have connectionism. We've already talked about this before. That increased connections between the stimulus and then the response, or the stimulus and then the, the, the reaction or the impact, is going to cause uh, acquisition. And when you walk into people like uh, Krashen and the and uh, his theory for second language learning, you're going to see this, that you're going to have stimulus and response, and that's going to cause, um, that's what's going to cause language acquisition. Finally, in uh, the psychological framework there, look at learner differences. And it's basically all of the affective filter. The differences in a, in a person that's going to cause them to learn or not learn, whether they're motivated or not motivated, whether they're scared or not scared, whether they have confidence or don't have confidence, whole bunch of different factors that, psycho, that the psychological frameworks for second language acquisition focus on. Uh, and you as a researcher, if you're going to do it, you could just focus on just the affective elements. You could focus on the processing skills or, or strategies. or You can focus on the brain if you want to be a, a brain doctor and see how that works. There are different frameworks going on here. The last major framework is the social, and there is the micro-social. These are people who study the little changes within language. So, for example, we have variation. Uh, theory, people who alter their language to fit the situation. Uh, you're speaking to your boss, you'll use certain language. You're speaking to a male, certain language, a female, certain language. It's interesting for me, coming from a, uh, a, a background where I've studied and lived in Japan for years, where you can listen to someone talk and you see their register change. Um, I remember arguing with a friend of mine. Okay, now we're friends. We're at this level. We're arguing with a friend of mine, and they're talking back and forth at friendship language, and the phone rings. 
And my friend goes to answer the phone, and all of a sudden, his language goes up. He's proper. He's polite. He's nice. And he finds out that it's his boss. It goes up even higher. He's more proper. He's more polite. Um, and so you just see those differences, variation theory. Accommodation theory, uh, how people alter their language to fit in. I don't know about you, but you know I go to uh, south, the southern part of the United States. I go to England. I go to Australia, and it doesn't take me long to learn their vocabulary, to learn their dialect, uh, their pronunciation, and I try to accommodate. Uh, that's what that would be. Socioculture theory, that acquisition and therefore acquisition, I'm sorry, that interaction and therefore acquisition occurs in a sociocultural context. I can't learn language unless I'm in some sort of sociocultural context. And so we can study that and see how that's done and see how that aids or doesn't aid language learning. That's all micro. Okay. We also have the macro uh, social areas of study. For example, acculturation theory, right? People accepting or not accepting or being accepted or not accepting. Um, I, that second language. Acculturating is that, actually that process of, of saying, I'm going to join this, right? Social psychology, psychology how are social issues uh, like gender or identity or power or status, right? How does that impact language learning? Um, if there's a power issue and you're down here trying to learn that second language, it's going to be a little more difficult. If you're at the top in power and you're learning that other language, it might be easier because you'll have uh, you'll have the the quote unquote power. Uh, maybe other issues, maybe the other way as well. I'm a, I'm better than you as far as power is concerned. Therefore, I'm not going to learn your language. You have to learn mine, and and there may be you know frustration that way. Well, the point is the social psychology area studies those areas. Um, it's interesting when you look at all of these areas, look at what the researcher, the linguistic researcher, can investigate. They can investigate the linguistics of it, the hard structural elements, either within the brain or um, uh, how it's used, right? The, the actual language use of it. You've got the social psychologists. I mean, they can study so many things, uh, especially when you get down into these areas. And then the social which is very popular now. Uh, people are trying to study uh, things like the uh, constructivist theor uh, theories or the constructivist paradigm where uh, you construct meaning. And the, all of these areas are here that uh, researchers can investigate. And it's a very interesting field now because there are so many places that you can play. And as I mentioned in an earlier session, there are a lot of areas and if you want to get a picture of everything, you eventually need to step back and say, okay, how does all this work? How does all this fit together so we can create a comprehensive uh, theory of uh, second language acquisition? Anyway, that's the end of my foundations of second language acquisition. I do hope that you enjoy this. If you do have any questions, please let me know. Talk to you later.